Wait, it's not ready. <clears throat> so our theme this morning is on the challenge of conflict transformation, especially in settings where conflict has not only had a long history, um, but has had serious levels of violence that many of you um, have experienced and continue to experience uh, on a daily basis. Many years ago, <clears throat> I started using the word uh, transformation instead of the concept of resolution. Not that I have any opposition to the wonderful skills and abilities that come with conflict resolution, but simply from the viewpoint that uh, we have to have capacities to think very strategically about the changes that we're trying to promote. And the word transformation, for me, helps us think more clearly about the nature of social change, but also the different facets of change that are happening at the same time in these settings. And I remember very clearly in the 1980s when I did one of my very first workshops in Central America. It was a period of time where there were three countries that had open civil wars that were ravaging the region and displacing people and creating large uh, numbers of uh, refugee camps, um, I was meeting with local community leaders and proposed that we start some training workshops on conflict resolution. And one of my good friends um, from uh, the region raised the question about what was meant by this word uh, conflict resolution. And he said, uh, you know, if what you're proposing is that you're coming down here to um, solve problems without changing anything, we're not that interested because we've seen a lot of that before. And that phrase had several things embedded in it that I think are absolutely critical for what you are doing as movements across the globe. Uh, the first is that <clears throat> When he said, uh, if you're coming down here, there's always this tension between people who are from a setting, who have lived and worked and have been there for a long time, and people who come from outside with good intentions to support the kind of change that you're hoping to produce. Uh, but it is very significant that people from settings, from locations and countries and communities, are engaged directly and are given uh, the respect and the support they need to bring forward a full understanding of the context that they have, that they have to face, that they have to deal with, they have to respond to. And that those of us that are in support roles understand how we do that in ways that are appropriate. The second part of his statement was, for me, absolutely critical. And that was that if you are coming here to solve problems but not change anything, now that phrase, not change anything, means that we can sometimes approach the immediate challenges that we have on a daily basis and try to figure out solutions to whatever that crisis of the day is. And once we find a solution to that immediate crisis or situation, we discover later that we found a solution to a problem, but we didn't change anything, and it keeps coming back in new and creative and different forms. And this is precisely the question of the short and the long term, but it's also the question of how much we develop an ability to think well and strategically about change. And that's where it started for me, how to help people think more strategically about change. So the conflict transformation approach will ask you consistently to look carefully, not just at the problems you have, but rather at the deeper patterns that tend to produce those problems. And then to think very carefully about strategies that have an ability to both be creative in responding to the immediate problems, but in that creativity make proposals for the, me the, the medium and longer term changes that you really want to have happen. So that you are constantly informed by a vision of change and you're constantly learning 
on a day-to-day -day basis what opportunities you have and how you can approach those um, with strategies that really contribute to change. Now, let's ask the question, how and by what ways do we understand the nature of change? And what I have suggested in much of my approach is that there are at least four facets or four elements of change that are simultaneously connected and are interacting with each other, but that we can take the time to look more carefully at how those work and what they mean for us as people who are committed to changing um, the violent patterns that may be happening in a given situation and building a more robust uh, set of relationships um, that can be carried forward. And the four kinds of changes that I'd like to mention are these. First, conflict will always have something to do with personal change. Um, this is the, if you will, the, the part of the process that requires you as a person, as a human being, to look carefully at your own life, your own patterns, your own ways of being, and how you will choose to be in settings of conflict, but you also have to know that people who are across from you, who may be different than you, who may not share your viewpoints, are also people. And they're people who have been impacted by this conflict. And that we know um, from, from many of the things that we've experienced and done, how much conflict impacts us as persons. Our tendencies to feel uh, the heartbeat increase, uh, maybe our ability to talk isn't quite as clear when we feel confronted, maybe we uh, have a tendency to pull back and away from people that we find um, uh, create for us a threat in some form or fashion. All of these things have to do with the personal change that's going on in a given context. Um, now. I'm recognizing that we've got uh, some interesting challenges on the sound here because we're filming this in the breakfast area. And when you're in Colombia, uh, people talk uh, uh, very much uh, at breakfast in ways that may be interfering with our uh, ability to film this. So imagine that you're at breakfast with us and that part of what has to happen at the personal level of change is precisely what's happening at a table across the way here. Two people sitting, sharing their lives, talking about what's happening to them and where they're going. But it also is about a commitment, um, and for me this is particularly important in settings where there's been a lot of violence, that people look carefully at the kind of commitments and the horizon of change that they're really committed to. And I think for Global Unites, one of the things that youth have to do is to develop the habit of deep personal reflection early and consistently throughout a lifetime of work. Too many times we get carried away by the demands and the pace of work that we're doing and we lose track of the reflective spaces that we need to actually consistently develop ourselves well. Uh, to be able to choose how we're going to be in a setting that is divided and where there are deep patterns of, of violence. The second area is that there's change that has to happen in relationships. And a lot of what I work with is relationship-centered. And in this case, when I say relational change, I'm actually referring to, to relationships between people who live in close proximity, who have day-to-day -day interaction, and or people who represent movements uh, and spaces that are really significant in a given location. Relational change is about the way that conflict tends to separate us into groups, how it tends to create polarization and escalating polarization. And that polarization quite often will leave uh, social movements and social spaces deeply divided. And relational change is about strategies of building and rebuilding the trust and understanding that has to happen between people for change to, to take place and be sustainable. This, uh, for me, uh, sits at the core of much of the work of conflict transformation. Much of what conflict does, especially violent conflict, is it destroys the fabric 
of society, destroys the essence of strong and trustworthy and trusting relationships. And rebuilding trust is often at the core of how you create movement toward things that can be sustainable uh, within a society. The third, which uh, is not always clear for many people who work in the wider fields of, of peace building, is how significant structural and systemic change really is in a given society. So the relational is about ongoing dialogue and engagement, but you have to look carefully at what things need to change in terms of the bigger patterns that have happened over time and how those have been reflected in the institutions and in the structures that in principle are, we establish as human communities to provide service to people. And many of those uh, institutions, structures, have a lot to do with how decisions are made, how power is shared or not shared, how there is access to and sharing of resources that are needed for a strong daily life. And the challenge of structural change is that this is often about engaging things um, that take a longer time than typically is done in, say, workshops and engagement uh, of uh, dialogue or even some forms of conflict resolution. And I think when my friend said, if you're coming here to solve problems but not change anything, in part what he had in mind was that sometimes we move so quickly to solve a problem that's very visible that we miss how deep and significant the changes are that will be needed in the institutions, the structures, the patterns of power, and the depth of which there is typically forms of exclusion and um, manipulation and corruption in the ways that those institutions have been established. And those are the challenges that we have to think about very, very strategically. Because when you work at changes that are embedded in the institutions, um, structures, and historic patterns, you're often working on medium to long-term strategies, five to ten and even fifteen and twenty-year uh, horizons. And it's difficult for people to imagine that conflict transformation isn't just about solving a problem that we want to get rid of today or in the coming year or two, but it's about strategies of change that will require a commitment out across decades. And so the structural change uh, often requires long-term commitment. And we know from all of our experience that the funding strategies and the kind of supports that we receive are often given to us in the form of short-term projects, one, maybe two, three years. And we have to be very, very uh, oriented toward bringing forward proposals that say we can do these things within the framework of a project, but we have to think carefully how these begin to contribute to the longer-term change that we're after. And finally, one that is particularly context-related. There are many patterns that are deeply, deeply cultural around conflict. And the cultural patterns uh, of every location always have things that are um, positive, life-giving, interesting, new ways to approach and understand and respond to conflict. And all cultures have things that begin to relate to patterns that replicate exclusion, manipulation of power, or create harm um, and not full participation uh, in the human community. Now, from when we come from outside of a culture, it's often very easy for us to pinpoint things that we think are wrong or not working well that should be changed. The more difficult process is how to engage the culture, cultural patterns uh, with a real respect for the positive and the good, while at the same time engaging from the context in a way that people there help identify those things that they feel most need to be changed. And that, uh, those four, I think, are the facets of, of transformation that simultaneously are going on. And I think a youth, uh, a global youth movement of the kind that you're involved in has enormous opportunity to think precisely about some of these issues. Um, and, and I think it starts with uh, the personal journey. It's very hard to do this work unless you have given some time and reflection 
to developing your own set of values and the orientation that you have, but also the sort of commitment that you're going to bring to this and how you will choose to be in the world. It then opens up the spaces of who you will choose to relate with and how you will engage people, even across divides. And then it comes to the question very concretely of what are the deep historic patterns of how structures have been established where we live? What are the things that are continuing to repeatedly contribute to violence and how do we change those patterns? And of course there is a very big issue for many of you as youth in many locations of how significant culture is, at least in two different ways. One is that many of the cultures have an enormous and very positive and very much needed respect for the elder, for elders, for those who have gone before you, for parents, for grandparents, for people who are significant. But quite often there is also at the same time a need to develop patterns by which youth are included more in the ways that communities make decisions and are respected for the capacities that they have and can bring around innovations that are needed. The second big piece of the youth and culture is that when you have lived across decades or generations in locations that have had open violence, quite often that violence is placed physically in the hands of younger people. Younger people are often asked to be at the at the very uh, front line of how and where violence is taking place. And I have noticed how much um, guns, weapons, and violence has impacted the, the, the deep positive characteristics of culture when it begins to take over as a culture itself. And that we're actually dealing with changes uh, around the culture of violence. And at the fore of that are youth. And I think this is one of the most significant things that you all have to contribute. Now I'm going to move for just a short period of time to a second area, which is the difference between uh, content of the conflicts that you begin to see and the relational context. This is very much at the core of a transformational perspective. And it comes back to some of what I was discussing earlier uh, in the facets or the elements uh, of change. Uh, I think it can be very helpful for you to have opportunity to work specifically on understanding two levels of conflict. One level is the more immediately visible content, uh, issues over which people are fighting. Now it could be that in a local community people may be uh, in disagreement over the use of a piece of land. It may be that they're um, arguing over who should be appointed to a certain committee. It may be that they have uh, some deep division over the use of a particular natural resource, how water will be distributed, or how one will uh, engage with um, a new roadway that's going to be built through the community. Those things often represent the content of a conflict. Underneath that content, content and less visible is, is the, uh, what I would call the relational context. And I often approach this by drawing a very simple drawing or using, like I have right beside me or behind me, a plant that's a potted plant where you can see above the ground the plant, and you can, see, but you cannot see, though you know it's there, you cannot see below the ground the roots that are looking for uh, water and uh, nutrients to feed the plant. And the difference between the content and the relational context is very much in line with this uh, uh, basic view of how the plant structure works. Above ground, you can see the rise of conflict as it's expressed in arguments and fights and even great divisions and violence over particular issues. Below the ground are the relationships and the patterns that have defined those relationships over a long period of time. And the challenge is specifically for conflict transformation, how to be creative in the way you approach the symptomatic content of that conflict, how it's seen, the problems that are coming with it, but you have to also develop an ability to move into the relational context and the deeper patterns that are happening. 
sustainable change combines those two things. It sees the content of a particular conflict as an opportunity to address the deeper patterns that tend to produce those conflicts. And it's in that deeper pattern, in that relational context, that I think your youth movement should give particular attention. You should begin a very systematic approach in whatever location that you live in to asking the question, not just what are the problems we want to solve, but how do those problems create opportunity to address the deeper relationship patterns that have not been constructed and that continually and repeatedly produce conflicts that are both violent, manipulated, and quite often very, very harmful to our communities. And if you're capable of understanding this deeper relational pattern, you're able to begin to design approaches that go beyond the simple solving of a given problem and begin to actually contribute in very significant ways to change. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions that need to be addressed that I have not done adequately. So I'm going to rely on my daughter to be the spokesperson uh, of your movement to ask a question or two, although the noise is getting louder and the uh, papaya is beginning to go through the form of liquid that can be uh, taken in the morning uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a wonderful drink. So we'll see if we can survive uh, the next few minutes. Okay, just two questions. Um, from your experience, what are the key ingredients that are needed to not only create the summit and begin to build these relationships, but man maintain them globally? And then two, how do you see a transnational network or movement like this one connected to conflict transformation? So that we're looking at the deep local context, but also constructing a transnational network. What are the opportunities? What are potential challenges? Okay. Great questions. Let me say that first, I think um, what, what you're involved in is actually about creating a movement and a process of change and not just an event. And I think one of the most significant things you have to develop is an ability not to focus exclusively on events that somehow get woven together somewhat randomly over time, but to understand that this is about a process uh, of transformation. Uh, of which events may be a part, but are not the driving force. And when it's transnational, there are several things that come into this that are really significant. The first is that, um, and I would use very much uh, in some of my writing, the, the approaches of uh, a spider and the web approach at, at times is what I refer to it. A web, um, a, a, one of those big spider webs that's orbital in their nature that many of you have seen, functions on the basis of having an, an ability to locate key anchor points, but an ability to cross-stitch relationships in very unusual ways because their notion of strength is not the strength of, of say, iron that you can't bend, but is the strength of flexibility. That is the ability to keep coming back to original purpose. And I think one of the keys to a transnational movement is having great clarity about purpose. The second um, key to this is that strength for um, a spider web combines independence and interdependence. Independence, uh, obviously the web, you see very visibly the interdependence, how many connections are happening across different ways. So there's, very, there's almost no centralization um, of power in, a, in the strength of a, of a spider web. The opposite is true. Strength lies in this extraordinary interdependence of cross-linking relationships. And cross-linking means that you may link regionally, you may link across the globe, you may link to a higher levels of, of youth that are involved in politics, you may link to very local grassroots levels. That linkages of interdependence is really significant. But independence means that each and every part of the web can continue to do what it's doing whether other parts have been damaged or destroyed. So if you look at a spider web that has been hit by wind or rain, 
you'll notice that some part of the web may be falling apart while other parts of the web continue to hold in place. And this is the notion of interdependence and independence, that every part of the whole is capable of continuing its work, independent of whether other parts are intimately involved in their work. And I think this is really important because the strength of the whole depends upon the strength of each capacity. So the national movements and the subnational movements of youth have to function by ways that they are not dependent on other people to help them work, but that they have their own capacity to continuously involve themselves in the work they're doing. And this strengthen, this will strengthen uh, the whole. And so for me, part of what you're doing at this event, um, the summit, is that it affords you an opportunity to really clarify overall purpose, clarify ways that each of the units, the national units and the subnational units, can develop vision and strength, and then to strengthen the, the cross linkages of solidarity and support that may be needed. But to do that without creating unnecessary dependence from outside. Because if and when you create dependence, that nothing can function until certain people have made decisions or until certain people are, pre are, are present, you have a weakness of the ability of the process itself to move forward where it needs to move forward. Those are the main things that I would suggest that we've learned from a transformational model. Thank you. Thank you.